You know, the reason these Shop Saber IS series cut so well and have such great edge finishes starts with the base frame. The base frame on these machines are structural steel, they're all welded, so that entire base is one piece. Then you have a tubular steel all welded gantry and tubular steel supports. But now let's look at what makes things actually move. The axis of motion is determined by these precision guide rails and we use those in all three axes. But you know what really determines accuracy is the machining that lies underneath it. Since we fabricate a machine our own frames, we can control how accurate these machines are. Now let's look at what really makes things move. What creates machine motion are the precision ball screws that we use in X, Y, and Z axis. Now I get asked a lot about ball screws versus rack and pinions, and the answer is really clear. Ball screws are higher precision. That's why the machines that are used to machine the precision frames all have ball screws. If you look at a rack and pinion system, there's some inherent play in it, and that's because it requires three to five thousandths of clearance between the pinion and the rack. All right. Now, it, you run into companies that say, oh, well, we saw that because we use planetary drives. Well, they don't understand the engineering because their planetary drive doesn't replace that mesh. So what happens is not only do you have the three to five thousandths, you have some more play that you've added on. We know all about this technology because we use that on some of our lower end machines, but these are machined to a grade CNC router, so they have to have precision ball screws. Now, on top of that, we use Mitsubishi closed loop servo motors and matching Mitsubishi drives. The final part of motion control is the control itself. Let's take a look at it. We base the Shop Saber MMP control system on a very robust technology. In fact, MMP stands for Mitsubishi Motion Platform. But there's another part of machine control that's people related. Specifically, how easy is it going to be for one of your operators to learn how to use it? So our real focus on the front end of the computer was that, to make it simple for one of your employees to run this so you don't have to hire an engineering type employee. Let me show you how easy that is. The thing that really stands out when you first look at the Shop Saber MMP operator control screen is that everything is organized onto a single screen, so it makes it really easy to run. And if you notice, you'll have different functions grouped, like these are the jogging functions, these are the operational functions, like home in the machine and set zeros. Here are the coordinates displayed, and also you can actually change feed rates and spindle RPMs while the program is running, so it's really nice. Plus you have an area over here that displays the program, and this is the G-code. All the operator has to do is to open the program, Right, when we click this button, it immediately gets displayed here. So that's visual validation that you've opened the correct program. And then to operate it, we simply hit the green button, and then you'll see the actual machine motions recorded on this screen. So it's a really, really nice and simple way to run the machine. Now, let's go take a look at the machine spindle. This machine has an HSD 10 horsepower ATC spindle. ATC stands for automatic tool change. Now, the spindle is actually mounted to a tool plate, and there's a lot of engineering involved. In fact, if you look at these two stiffeners, there's an interesting story on those. Engineering wanted to create more rigidity where the tool touches the material. And so they realized if they could stiffen that whole assembly that they would accomplish that. So we used finite element analysis software for all of our design and testing. And this is what came out. And once it proved out, then we went back and we cut some of these out, which reduced the mass. Now, when we're talking about engineering, there's another interesting thing that you'll notice on this machine, and that's balancing cylinder. Now, what happens is in 3D machining, typically the slowest axis determines your maximum feed in 3D, and normally that's always going to be Z. So we realized if we could reduce the weight of the spindle, we could actually raise and lower it much, much faster. And that's what the balancing cylinder does. It neutralizes this mass. So you'll find these machines actually cut in 3D really, really fast. And also that's related directly to drilling, so they drill faster. Now let's take a look at the machining table. This particular IS-510 has a phenolic vacuum table. Let's look at that a little closer. These are vacuum ports. There's eight of them. They're controlled by four valves, and they're actually connected to the vacuum plenum, which is part of the machine frame, with large tubes. Then a four inch tube goes from there all the way back to the vacuum pump. So we get unbelievable flow in the vacuum table system. Now something else that's neat about these, these tables are actually machined with the router heads, so they're incredibly flat. What that means to you is typically you don't have to have gasket between the table and the spool board. 
Now, also, while we're talking about the table, let's look at the width here. It's bigger than five feet, and I'll explain to you why. It actually measures 77 inches. Let's say you're a cabinet shop and you buy this machine to make kitchen cabinets, and you find out how lucrative the closet business is, and so that becomes a, a part of your business. Well, closets have a lot more drilling than cabinets, so you say, boy, I wish I had a boring block. I wish I bought my machine with a boring block. Well, that's an upgrade in the field, so you can actually add the boring block at a, at a later date, and that's why this table is so big. Now, there's one other feature I really want to point out that I really like. <clears throat> this has pop-up pins. So there's five different pop-up pins. Here's what those do. They enable your operator to just put the material on the table, slide at those pins, it's automatically aligned, the vacuum goes on, when the spindle starts, the pins retract. So it's really, really easy for the operator. Now, let's go design something. I wanted to do a CNC project that involved aluminum. You know, CNC routers are really good for cutting aluminum. In fact, they're superior to mills in a lot of cases because number one, first off, the spindle RPMs are higher so you can feed faster and the work envelopes are much larger. So you can take a nest of aluminum parts just like we would do with wood or plastic and cut them on a CNC router. Now there's a couple of requirements that you have to have. One's going to be keeping the cutter cool and we do that with a mist lubrication system called U-Mist. The other part is how you actually handle the tool and we'll get to that later. Let's take a look at the layout that we're gonna cut first. A customer came in the other day with an aluminum instrument panel to see if we could cut it with a CNC router. Let me show you what that looks like. We actually on the screen here have two of them and the material was uh, 80 thousandths thick, 60, 61 aluminum. And it machines really, really well. And you can see these are basically nested on the table. Uh, now, before we talk about tool pathing, let's talk about the tooling requirements for machining this material. Standard router bits cut aluminum pretty well, but if you really want the optimum edge finishes, you, you probably need to use some specialized tools. We're going to be using a Vortex 5625A. Now that tool is a single flute tool, and it's called an O-flute, so it, it has a certain shape that forms the chips a certain way. The one we're using is a quarter inch in diameter, and we typically want the cutting length to be as short as we can get by with. Now, to understand feeds and speeds and how we get there, there's a concept that you need to understand. It's called chip load. Let's take a look at the chip load chart. Chip load basically is how thick is the chip that's formed as the cutter goes through. The faster you go, the thicker the chip. The slower you go, the thinner the chip. What we do is we consult with this chart from the manufacturer, and they tell us with a quarter inch bit to cut uh, in aluminum, we want a chip load of about five to seven thousandths. So for our purposes, we'll probably say, okay, let's try to hit six thousandths. Now let's go to the feed and speed calculator and figure out how we achieve that. To simplify our feed and speed calculations, we're gonna use a calculator built into Fusion 360 software. It's a great way to explain these concepts. So what we have is a flat end mill. It has one flute. It's a quarter inch in diameter. Okay, let's go over here to feeds and speeds. And you'll see a couple of things, spindle speed, you'll see surface speed, you'll see cutting feed rate and feed per tooth. And those things are all related to each other. Now let's say for instance, our feed per tooth, we decided we were gonna target 6,000. So 0 .006, all right, so we'll enter that. And let's say we want to cut it, say 12,000 RPMs. All right, and it's also calculating surface speed. And let me explain what that is. That is how fast through the material that the tip of the cutting edge is, is going. So the higher RPMs, the faster that goes. Now, there's a little room there uh, depending on the material itself, and sometimes you want to play with that base it on edge finish. Okay, but now what that tells us is in order to, to achieve that, we need to feed at 72 inches a minute. And let's say I've done some experimentation. I found that 76 actually cuts a little bit better. And so basically what that does, you know, it makes our chip thickness a little bit more. But that's what's critical about feeds and speeds. Number one, you want to identify what the correct chip load is for the tool, and then you want to either mathematically calculate this or do like me, go to a chart, plug the numbers in, and it'll tell me what RPMs to run the spindle and what feed rate to use. That's how you determine feeds and speeds for aluminum. Now, let's go into our tool pathing. The way I undertake tool pathing a project like this is the first thing I do is look at the geometry and see what kind of strategies we need to use. Let's take a look at that. If you notice on these panels, there's a lot of small holes, and it turns out they're all eighth inch in diameter, so it makes sense just to drill those. 
Then we get some more holes here. There's here, and there's four of those. And they're actually .28, and uh, we'll probably machine those just with a quarter-inch router bit. Then when we get to these larger pieces of geometry, it probably makes sense just to pocket those out, and then we don't have to worry about the small pieces of scrap in the middle. And when we get to the larger cutouts, we'll just leave those tabs. So we'll have a couple tabs on each one that really break real easy, and that keeps those in place. Now, let's actually look at the tool pass. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drill the holes, and let's look at simulation. You'll see that. Now, what you see, the red lines are wrapping moves. The green lines are the actual hole drill tool pass. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing here, and let's run those. And now let's look at this, the smaller holes here, and we'll simulate those. And then we'll go to the inside, the large ones, and we'll cut those. And then our final operation is to actually cut the outsides. And that's all that's required. So once we get that done, we've simulated it, we're happy with it. Then we output the G-code, we send it to the machine, let's go make these parts. Our instrument panel came out really, really good. You know, this is 6061 aluminum, and you look at the edge finishes, and you can really see the rigidity in the frame and that ball screw system, especially when you look in the corners and see how consistent they are. If you have any questions, you can contact us at shopsaber.com. Thank you for watching. <laughs>